Uh, so, uh, great, great, good evening, colleagues. We we are going a little forward with our engagements to do with clinical nutrition and some bit of uh, diet therapy that we are merging to try and give you a, a clear understanding and a clear picture uh, about this part of the nutrition. Uh, we we had started earlier on uh, uh, last week when we were looking at uh, the introduction to clinical nutrition, we went from there, looked at the nutrition care process. We went from there, we looked at uh, uh, the nutrition assessment, nutrition intervention, nutrition diagnosis, and nutrition evaluation and monitoring. But then we came and measured at nutrition uh, uh, and, and nutrition intervention where we were looking at uh, parenteral nutrition, we actually looked at enteral nutrition first, then we came and looked at the parenteral nutrition, the peripheral parenteral nutrition, the total parenteral nutrition. Uh, then we came a little forward, we looked at uh, the nutrition assessments, we uh, calculated the BMI and ETC. Then uh, yesterday we were looking at malnutrition uh, and looked at the marasmic kwasha core, the protein energy malnutrition. And DTC, we looked at the categories of uh, how these present and what are the signs and symptoms uh, in which these present by. Uh, so today we are going to be uh, shifting. Since yesterday we looked at malnutrition and saw that it is uh, in two forms. We looked at the undernutrition and the overnutrition. However, uh, people always confuse this. That's why terms like the uh, burden of uh, malnutrition, the double burden of malnutrition was coined because of uh, the overnutrition that was always lagging. But we also talked about uh, the micronutrient deficiencies that always tend to be ignored by uh, a lot of literature and other people uh, during the practice. However, we saw the reasons as to why uh, when we are talking of malnutrition or undernutrition specifically, we are looking at inadequate intake, coupled with uh, malabsorption and also uh, coupled with uh, poor uh, utilization. Okay, yeah, someone could be taking in the food. Uh, there could be issues with the access. The person can notably access the food due to risks such as poverty and other things. Then when we came to absorption, we looked at things to do with uh, failure to absorb the digestible food or also uh, things to do with the chronic illnesses, uh, ETC. Uh, then uh, we looked at also when we talked of overnutrition, we are looking at you pumping the body with a lot of nutrients, more than what it requires. And what does it do at the end of the day? It will have no option rather than to keep all the nutrients piling up, uh, leading to higher uh, BMIs, or what we call the body mass index. And also those conditions that come, uh, uh, that are associated to uh, high uh, uh, body mass index, uh, kilograms per meters, square uh, things to do with the metabolic syndrome, the hypertension, the diabetics, uh, the cardiovascular diseases, ETC. So today we are going to delve deeper and look at obesity and weight management. I remember uh, when we were looking at uh, the uh, categories, BMI categories, uh, we looked at the cutoffs, the different cutoffs, the 18.5, less than 18.5 being for the uh, underweight. Then we looked at the normal status being between 18.5 to uh, 24.9. Then from there, we looked at overweight starting with a 25 to 30, then 30 to, I uh, remember something around 33, that would be uh, obesity class one and ETC as you have read in your notes. So today we are going to be looking at uh, the learning objectives and by the end of this course we expect you to define the obesity and its causes and consequences and prevention strategies. How are you going to be able to prevent uh, obesity? And also we are looking at you being able to identify the factors that influence weight management such as energy balance and uh, metabolism and also behavior change. Behavior change is a really big topic that we cannot raise uh, talk a lot, uh, talk, talk enough about with the different theories that raise people have come up with the uh, health belief models and all those other types of things. Uh, really, uh, behavior change is an intervention. Uh, remember, you can only do as much, you can only do the talking and you will leave the decisions to be made by the person you're trying uh, to change or to intervene on. 
so you don't have a lot of control about how they will perceive whatever you're telling them. That's why behavior change is a little challenging. But once done correctly and once the appropriate measures and theories are used, in most cases we tend to see results happening faster because a person is involved uh, in this. Okay, then uh, we are going to be able to apply the principles of nutrition and physical activity to design a weight management plan for oneself and for others. And that's why I always say that you cannot get everything from the books because sports nutrition uh, or uh, let's call it physical activity is a broad subject that needs a lot of attention to be paid to. But you as a nutritionist, we expect you to be all around and understand the different dynamics uh, that are in this field and also we expect you to be able to evaluate the effectiveness and uh, the safety of various weight loss um, methods okay so uh, obesity we are saying this is a medical condition characterized with excessive accumulation of body fat which poses uh, health uh, risks and how is the body fat accumulating? The body fat accumulates in two ways, by excessive intake of the fat itself and also by excessive intake. Actually, we could call it calorie, okay? Calorie from the carbohydrates and also calorie from the fat. At the end of the day, we see that this is stored in the different places that brings uh, all these uh, health issues coming up. Then with the overweight, we are saying this refers to the to having a body weight that exceeds what is considered uh, healthy for a given height, but not necessarily indicating body fat. Okay, That is when we talked about uh, people who have a lot of muscle mass at the end of the day. So we could conv confuse these people as being uh, overweight and tell them you man you need to tone down on your eating but what they build is muscle mass and with no muscle is built by protein okay carbohydrates can't build your muscle and also the fats can't build your muscle you can only build this muscle mass uh, by protein so that's where we say this would be the limitation of using bmi as a an indicator uh, for uh, and uh, for overnutrition or call it obesity and overweight Okay, and uh, we are saying uh, obet uh, obesity rates are increasing and uh, on a rise globally and uh, we know why this is happening because of the sedentary lifestyles we are living and also the reduced physical activity. Right now, uh, uh, the teachers, your tutors, your lecturers are teaching online. We are not doing the standing. Right now I'm seated where I would be moving across the class, writing on the whiteboard or the blackboard, and also uh, engaging in all those other activities, trying to swing my hands here and there, uh, doing the explanations. But right now, I'm just seated in one place and delivering the service. Uh, also, the uh, lifestyle uh, change, also the drastic improvement in uh, technology. Right now, uh, if you're very versed with technology, there is what we call Vision Pro that was released by uh, Apple stores, I hope you know what Apple is, that uh, uh, technology company uh, that is releasing the iPhones and all those other things, I, I, Airport, it released uh, what we call Vision Plus, and Vision Plus is a gadget that looks more like those uh, uh, glasses, you know, these glasses that you put on those specs or the sunglasses. So once you put this on, you can easily access all the social media sites, you can access the games, but it has what we call uh, simulations and also augmented reality whereby swiping you're swiping in air people can see you swiping in air but really you're interacting with the device so all these things we are no longer putting in a lot of effort people are playing video games instead of going out to the field to stretch and all those things and also the type of work we are doing uh, we are no longer engaged in money work most of us money work has been left to the robots and people are just seated controlling the robots. That's why you will see a, a driver part, but the driver has covered more kilometers than you. And we're also saying childhood obesity rates have tripled, and this is really alarming because we will soon see an end to malnutrition in form of underweight or undernourishment, and then start to appreciate overnutrition. And this is why it needs you to be a pro, or you know, when the trends change, you also change because you still have the same information that you can apply uh, and get the services delivered to people 
once you have the knowledge uh, on how to deal with overweight and obesity and all those type of things and it is challenging that in most cases they, if someone is uh, obese uh, in child uh, if there is childhood obesity then we believe this person still will become obese later on uh, in their lives and also uh, it is not a good practice for, to give the children all those sweets all those uh, other uh, sweet sweet and sugary things and sugary stuff and also overfeeding children people believe that the fatter the child is uh, the more the care uh, the more it shows that this child uh, is being uh, well cared for and also we understand that uh, in these developing countries there are a lot of child rights i'm not saying go on and starve your children but then uh, we need to make sure that this doesn't become a problem for us later on uh, since it is a serious uh, health concern. However much people have talked about uh, the poor diets and also the lack of physical activity, people are also talking about genetics playing a, a pivotal role in this and also the environment being able to influence uh, this. And uh, uh, most of the uh, ways we could uh, uh, try to counter this is through promoting healthy, uh, good healthy eating uh, behaviors, uh, creating those supportive environments uh, for children to make healthy choices. You will see people trying as much as possible to uh, have the adverts of Coca-Cola and uh, Fanta and all those other beverages that are high in calorie running on the TV every now and then and this of the uh, more healthy options. So uh, what, uh, what are the challenges of this? We are looking at the increased uh, risk of the various health issues, uh, of various health issues, things such as the type 2 diabetes, the high blood pressure or hypertension, the heart diseases, uh, ETC. All right. Uh, so this is still the same, the health risks of obesity. We are looking at uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, heart disease, all the cardiovascular diseases, the stroke, the high blood pressure, or you could call hypertension, the high, high blood sugar, this you could also call uh, <coughs> uh, this is the uh, same thing uh, coupled with uh, diabetes. And also we could call, uh, uh, we could talk of the insulin resistance because uh, insulin uh, is required in regulating the amounts of sugar uh, that is uh, found uh, within uh, the body. Uh, so uh, things such as a premature death could also uh, be there, but really with insulin resistance, we'll have things such as uh, hyperglycemia that will be a uh, uh, found in uh, the in the blood of that individual. So, what is the economic impact of obesity? Economic, we are looking at in terms of money, okay, uh, value for money, or value or return on investment, or what would be the hindrance to the development. Uh, we are saying obesity contributes to loss of economic output and higher medical costs. You know, treating these uh, metabolic diseases is not really easy, okay. For example, if someone is obese, then they are not going to be able to be productive at the end of the day. We used to call these diseases of the rich, but now they are no longer diseases of the rich. Actually, they are diseases of the poor. You know why? It's because the poor are the ones with poor health choices. You don't know what to eat. At least a rich man can ably afford uh, the organic foods out in the world over uh, in these high... Uh, uh, high income countries compared to uh, okay we are still a little safe in our developing countries but we always try as much as possible to copy what those people in those developed countries are doing and at the end of the day uh, it affects us in this way that we uh, try as much as possible to copy them copy their eating styles start frying of the pizzas and the burgers and all those things really yet uh, those are uh, unhealthy food stuffs that are eaten out there but we try as much as possible to eat them here so at the end of the day if someone has a lot of weight we are going to spend a lot of money uh, treating them or we could also talk of the disability adjusted life years whereby this is the period of time that a person is supposed to be productive uh, there are dollars we are losing for, for you being bedridden uh, in that perspective uh, loss of productivity due to unemployment we can see that 
and also direct health care costs. Trust me, if uh, in most cases when someone is overweight, people don't employ them because they really feel at the end of the day, this person is not going to be as productive as they would have been uh, if they were in a, in a, a, a better or comfortable looking shape. Okay, so friends, let's let's look at a uh, uh, basal metabolic rate, and we are saying uh, the basal metabolic rate uh, is uh, the minimum rate of energy uh, expended at rest. Okay, this is the minimum amount needed for your body to function uh, when the body is at rest. And you know those uh, other systems that are still functioning. Okay, those physiological. Uh, uh, functions that need to keep running, such as the breathing, uh, the circulation, the cell, pro the cell production too. Uh, that these are the other activities that require to be running uh, when it, even if you are at rest, okay, even if you are sleeping. So, uh, what are the factors that affect this? We have age, okay, and we the age we are saying that the basal metabolic rate tends to decrease with age, primarily due to the increase in the mass and the changes of hormonal activity okay with age then your basal metabolic rate uh, is bound to decrease okay then uh, the resting state uh, also is uh, found to be uh, hindering uh, the basal metabolic rate then also we are looking at the exercise and food intake being one of the factors that affect uh, the basal metabolic rate okay so exercise metabolic rate here we are looking at calories expended during uh, physical activity those calories you tend to expend uh, you will see that there will be uh, guidelines if you're looking uh, to take a clear route in this uh, clean nutrition you will see guidelines of how many calories are expended when doing different different jobs that strenuous activities when people are doing aerobics how many uh, 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 calories do they expend and etc. Uh, activities like walking, climbing stairs, etc. Running, the brisk walking. This is where it needs to to come to your mind as a nutritionist working uh, in this weight loss or weight management programs. You need as much as possible to find those solutions that people really feel that are not very invasive and they can easily do. You're not going to force a person to start running on day one. Okay. but you can make them walk you can make them uh, appreciate dancing because you remember even during dancing someone is uh, releasing some uh, uh, calories that would uh, at the end of the day maybe be stored as fat and need to overweight then also uh, this we are looking at its contribution uh, to the expenditure of uh, the calories uh, factors contributing to obesity uh, like I told you okay uh, we have genetics Really, we don't have a lot we can do with the genetics, okay? Some people are in their genes, they, they are, you will see that uh, these persons are parents and also the grandparents who are really uh, overweight or they were really obese. And we will see that there is not much as nutritionists that we can do uh, on this because genetics uh, play a really a predisposing role in this okay and we are saying also these genetic variations can affect metabolism okay and remember when we talk of metabolism uh, this uh, includes how efficiently uh, the body can uh, work on those calories uh, still the genes are the ones responsible for the hormonal re regulation and also response to food okay because some genes uh, may influence how individuals respond to different types of food and also affect their eating because some people's genes they detest food that is not fried okay and in the end uh, these people uh, will uh, over consume the, the food uh, and the, at the end of the day these people uh, will become uh, obese okay so now let's look at environment and we are saying that uh, environment also plays a crucial role uh, in this uh, obesity or in the development of obesity since uh, it, it influences how really uh, people uh, work uh, or how really the people intake the foods or the choices that people really have. Uh, the food environment looking at the availability, accessibility and affordability of these unhealthy foods that are high in sugar. You will find that even the least trading center 
wherever it is they can at least uh, have coca-cola on their shelves or have fanta or have those beverages that are really high in sugar however much uh, coca-cola and all those companies are talking about uh, uh, the way of coke zeros trying to reduce the in uh, giving healthier options but really not a lot of effort has been uh, put in this and you also realize that the environment such as the urban decision and also the suburban have led to uh, discourage physical activity because we are going to run from if you are in an urban setting so uh, really you do not you do not have a place where you're going to be uh, expelling uh, this energy also we could look at uh, uh, access to resources that support people such as these recreational spaces the fields are no longer there because every place we want to build their upland and also are uh, still in these environments who could also talk with the cultures and also the social networks if uh, the people are with if the people are working with and not working out really I want to work out because I don't want to be uh, so uh, we need to, uh, yeah, to address this uh, environmental determinants of obesity uh, and also uh, try as much as possible to uh, create uh, measures for people to uh, do the exercise. However, we are not only talking of uh, uh, the, the fields that have been taken away, because even where fields have been taken away, people are building gyms, okay? And they are building these lifestyle centers, but it is about the people that do really, really do not want to go uh, into uh, this building. All right. Uh, I think we finish with that, and uh, now we are going to talk about uh, the physiology of obesity. Okay. When we talk of uh, the physiology of obesity, we are looking at uh, uh, the hypothalamus and the appetite uh, regulation. Okay, because we are, we we understand that uh, with obesity, this is a complex condition that has a, a, a few few processes that are really uh, in there that you could be able uh, to explain. Okay, so we have the hypothalamus and uh, uh, the the. Uh, appetite regulation. The hypothalamus is one that is uh, uh, more uh, to do with the regulation of appetite or that sends the signals to the brain uh, that there is a need of the food that uh, is required uh, by the body. Okay. Yeah. And we are looking at the efficiency of nutrient monitoring in obese individuals and also the metabolic differences between uh, the obese and the thin, you will find that most of uh, the thin people have a higher metabolic rate uh, compared to uh, the obese because the obese have a low metabolic rate and also sometimes we find it vice versa that the obese have a higher metabolic rate compared to the people who are thin so it is always fluctuating here and there due to other different circumstances and the conditions uh, that are people are falling Really, we need to appreciate things to do, uh, such as the adipose tissue regulation, because we know adipose tissue, uh, or you could uh, term it as body part, uh, plays a, a very critical role uh, in this energy storage, because your energy will be stored uh, as fat, and if uh, it becomes large and dysfunctional, it will lead to uh, 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 what we could call maybe a change or an imbalance. Uh, uh, and also uh, alter regulation of metabolism uh, and inflammation. Okay, and there are a lot of uh, hormones in there that you will be looking up. The insulin resistance coming in, obesity uh, being always uh, associated with this, where other cells become uh, less responsive, responsive to uh, the effect of insulin, which, where, like I told you earlier, insulin is the one that is uh, required or it is the one that has a true uh, of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the role of regulating the blood sugar levels. Okay, uh, set point theory, we are saying uh, with the set point theory, uh, this suggests <coughs> sorry about that. We are saying uh, this suggests that our body is trying to maintain Weight within a narrow range, okay, 
Yeah, and uh, in most cases, people say this is uh, genetically uh, predetermined. Uh, most of us know uh, those uh, should we use uh, a thermostat. Okay, you know, if things go uh, higher, high, it steps down. If things go down, it steps up uh, the absorption. Uh, something really uh, like that. So this is key uh, in regulation of body weight. And we are saying the body is believed to, uh, to possess most of uh, these regulatory systems that maintain weight. Uh, these uh, uh, would act maybe if we are talking about uh, the different feedback, feedback mechanisms and also uh, things to do with resistance with weight change. Uh, metabolic rates are just to keep weight stable, serving as a form of protection uh, against starvation. But really, mostly, this work, uh, uh, this is mostly uh, the physiology uh, of obesity. Okay, so uh, let's interest ourselves with uh, yo yo dieting. Uh, uh, with yo yo dieting, uh, this involves uh, weight loss by regaining uh, okay. We are saying that uh, yo yo dieting, uh, we are saying that this. Uh, looks at weight loss for the reading or even increased weight, okay? Or people sometimes stand with the side. Uh, so there is that pattern that is very visible. You're losing weight through a restriction of calorie uh, and dieting. Uh, yes, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, is everyone okay? Hello? Yes, hello. Yes, am I audible? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Yes, uh, I'm not getting you loud and clear. Your voice is a bit low, and uh, sometimes also the screen is not all that uh, appearing well. Oh, I thought I was clear. Please, friends, if you feel the voice is not very clear. You have a right to stop me and tell me to at least adjust on the volume. I think I can do that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, for the screen, I think I apologize for that one. Because if we put in full slideshow, uh, we will have challenges skipping to the next uh, part on this window. So I was still talking about your energy where we are saying this uh, involves a repeated uh, weight gain and also a repeated weight uh, weight loss, actually repeated weight loss, a full restriction of calories, followed by regaining weight, and also actually sometimes you will get additional weight than the one you had. And this cycle can perpetuate a pattern of weight loss and also regain over time. So with this, we will look at uh, uh, most people who are doing this year dieting. Uh, these are periods where people have this, their calorie intake uh, restricted. So, and also, uh, at, uh, this is aimed at achieving a rapid uh, weight loss with those diets uh, that are more restrictive. And also, we are looking at a prolonged calorie restriction can lead to metabolic adaptation, such as a decreased metabolic rate. Remember, now there is not a lot to break down. So the metabolic rate will decrease and also this changes in the hormonal levels and it will make it harder to maintain weight loss over time. So at the end of the day, uh, also the, if once the metabolic rate decreases, then uh, what we uh, is for the body to keep regaining their weight. And also uh, with this year dieting, some people have argued uh, that uh, what happens is there could be also some mental challenges that could come and also a potential health risks uh, linked to your dieting. Hormones and appetite regulation, we are saying leptin regulates appetite and fat storage, and we are saying obese individuals may have uh, leptin uh, resistance, whereas uh, ghrelin uh, stimulates hunger and appetite, and also the level rises before meals and drops afterwards. So after eating, that is why when uh, a person has finished eating a meal, even if you show them another meal, they really won't uh, pay a lot of attention to it and they really want to, uh, want to eat uh, as much of the food. All right, uh, let's uh, shift and look at uh, other factors still contributing to this thing. We're looking at our consumption of the meat to satiety issues rather than hunger. Okay, yeah, so people do not eat because they're hungry, but they eat because they want to get satisfied. 
Okay. Uh, so that is a, a major thing we have here in Africa. That we, we don't want to, to, to have any day where we feel that we are hungry. Okay, because uh, sometimes people will tend to eat supper, however much they have eaten, and also they have uh, taken in uh, a lot already during the day, but then still they will opt to eat supper so that they complete at the three meals of the day. And also we are talking about environmental and uh, physiological factors that are influencing eating behaviors. Like I told you, the environment where we live, the genes and ETC, the nature of fat cells, and we are saying some of these individuals may have more fat cells and large fat cells uh, than the others, and these increase through hyperplasia uh, during fetal and uh, early life stages. Okay, uh, social cultural factors in obesity, like I told us, the sedentary lifestyles and the technological advancements, really, these have uh, done more harm than good, and also the increased screen time has contributed to obesity. Uh, really, when we talk of screen time, some of you are looking at only TV. No, please, it is not about TV. Even right now, me looking at my laptop, um, this is screen time for me. When I look at my phone, that is screen time. All screens are screen time, okay? Because it, in most cases, you can't do something else when you're, you're on screen, if you can realize. Unless whatever you're paying attention to is not really big. In most cases, someone can't be uh, kicking football uh, while uh, watching uh, TV. In most cases, people sit down and watch TV. Or if it is uh, with the phones, uh, actually, even the people who are working with phones get a lot of accidents. Some accidents are more due to people holding phones. We are glued to them. I think that is a disadvantage with technology. However much it has more, uh, it has advantages, but then uh, its misuse has led to a lot of disadvantages because really uh, people are even losing uh, vision and sight because of uh, a lot of exposure to light. People have a lot of screen time because, uh, okay, giving myself as an example, I start work at 8, 8.30. And from 8.30, I only leave my place when I'm going to have breakfast. Uh, that is at around 9, 9.30. Then when I go to the field, still I move with the laptop. I open the laptop when I'm in the field. Then even when I come back home, and right now still I'm on the, on the screen, uh, it's coming to around 9 p.m. in Uganda here. I'm still on the screen. Once I shut this down, uh, well, once I'm done with uh, this lecture, I have a, a report to submit. And then when I submit that report, it will be around 10 or 10 something. I will go onto my phone and catch up with a few individuals. So you, if you're looking at all that screen time, there is no place where physical activity is taking place. And this is a real uh, image of uh, most of the real life scenario of most of the people who are out there. And also we're looking at food marketing, larger portion sizes and calorie dense foods uh, play a role in this. Food marketing, you know what this is. In most cases, uh, they entice the burger, they entice the sandwich egg, they entice these beverages, they entice the pizza. Actually, they have those promotions that are everywhere. Get to uh, buy one, get one free, etc. But all these are really promoting uh, unhealthy uh, eating behavior. Then we are also looking at uh, prenatal and early life influences. Uh, prenatal factors uh, like malnutrition and maternal obesity uh, can be predispose one to obesity and also the socioeconomic uh, impact uh, on the infant's uh, life. Assessing body weight and composition, this we did. And we are saying the essential part is necessary for normal body function. Okay, we are not saying all, all part is uh, supposed to be uh, left out because if uh, we also examine our brain, our brain is 95 or 90 percent fat. Okay, and we are saying ideal body fat percentages differ uh, in men uh, and women. Uh, body mass index, this was so, and we are saying this is calculated using weight and height. I hope you remember that story. And also the limitations include not accounting for gender uh, uh, or body compositions, uh, like you will see. If you go on uh, uh, what we call, uh, I think, uh, I don't know what I'm still in the class group, but I will, I will see if I can send someone a link. Uh, for you people, at least you can... Uh, 
you can uh, do uh, you can access uh, google play and in google play you will be able to download uh, that application that will help you calculate the body mass index once you put in the weight and put in the right height all right uh obesity categories based on bmi and health implications this we saw uh, with the healthy being 18.5 to 24.9 and also overweight 25 to 29.9 uh, and obesity being bmi over 13 and the morbid obesity or morbidly obese uh, being uh, over 40 and bmi may not be accurate for the well muscled and uh, the well muscled here we are talking about the people who are who are uh, 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 more into the gym and building uh, that muscle mass and also uh, we are looking at uh, very short individuals uh, whose height we can always uh, confuse okay the measurements this we saw the waist circumference okay mm -hmm. the waist <coughs> hip uh, we also saw all this uh, so for body fat we looked at the underwater weighing uh, everything this we didn't look at, but uh, things like the skin fold uh, thickness is there. Then there is also uh, bioelectrical bio impedance analysis, do energy X-ray absorptiometry, and also air uh, displacement. Uh, most of these uh, are a, a little more advanced. Uh, but then, uh, when we talk of uh, <coughs> uh, when we talk of uh, uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, when we talk of underwater uh, weighing, uh, in most cases, we are, are saying uh, this is uh, the most accurate uh, method uh, of telling, uh, uh, of uh, calculating uh, weight. Uh, most people have uh, termed it as a, a something to do with hydro, is it called hydro? hydrostatic way something like that and uh, they use this to estimate the body composition uh, really this uh, relies on the principle that the lean tissue are uh, looking at things to do with the muscles the bones and the organisms are denser than the fat tissue so the individual uh, with a higher proportion of lean tissue will weigh more underwater compared to those uh, with higher proportion of the fat tissue yeah so it's a test that is done but also uh, uh, it is really uh, good and uh, that is the whole uh, idea around uh, it yeah then so uh, for the skin fold measurements really uh, we, we, we we tend to understand that uh, these are simple and really are uh, used everywhere and uh, here we are looking at the thickness of the other subcutaneous fat that fat that is really located under the skin or the dermis as some people call it, uh, the specific sites are uh, using the uh, vernier calipers and all those other things uh, that will help you tell uh, the, the, uh, the, the thickness uh, of that uh, subcutaneous part that is found or located uh, in those uh, parts uh, of the body. Uh, but I remember having done this uh, some time back during my uh, uh, my bachelor's i'm really trying to uh, remember how it was done but then if I, I i get it somewhere i will have to come back and give it to you All right uh so for the bioelectrical impedance analysis uh, really this one uh, uh, is used uh, in estimating the body composition uh, looking at fat percentage in most cases, uh, uh, this is done uh, because, you know, uh, the fat will, uh, uh, what is it called? The fat will re resist the flow of electricity uh, through it. So this technique uh, is based on uh, the, the principle that uh, different tissues in the body, such as the muscles, fat, and bone, have different ele electrical uh, uh, conducting rates or conductivities. Eh? or do, due to that variation uh, in water content. Uh, so here, the individual will have to stand uh, barefoot on most of these scales, and uh, we hold on to electrodes with a lot of electricity, not that electricity that will shock that individual. And when this current flows through this person, 
uh, the, the, the amount of water and electrolytes in the body, which vary dependingly uh, on the different types. So uh, this device uses a lot of uh, data and algorithms to tell uh, how much, uh, though there are some factors that are taken into play, the age, the genders, the heights, etc. And this will all help us in estimating the composition levels. All right, uh, when managing weight, we are looking at the long-term health eating uh, behaviors, okay, and also the short-term dieting, which may not uh, lead to a uh, long-term uh, weight loss. Okay, uh, improving eating habits, study that choose for eating. Why is this person overeating? Are they eating because of their friends? Okay, are they eating because they really just want to eat? Uh, how, is the, 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 how is the genetics? Which foods do these people really like? So you should begin by these preferences. I know what to restrict, when to restrict, what are the times this person eats a lot. How do can we make this person busy to prevent them from overeating? You can always come up with different different uh, ways in which to make people uh, live their lives happy and not looking at their weight scale every time. So you also plan for the healthier eating. Seek for help from nutrition professionals. If any, I told you never die in silence when you have a client. You can tell a client come back tomorrow. Yeah, in most cases, you could tell them come back tomorrow, but you can't tell someone come back tomorrow before you've done anything. At least do something. Then for things where you feel things are not working well, for th places where you need to consult, you can say, uh, let me come back, let me get on a phone and I will come back to you or something like that and get you your information right. Trust me, uh, you the next client will come or who will come, you won't have uh, uh, to go to the phone again so that you can pick the information you want to relay uh, to that particular client. Uh, energy balance, uh, calories are a measure of energy from, from the food, like I told you. 3,500 excess calories, uh, they are saying you will gain uh, one pound, okay? And uh, if you uh, uh, expel 3,500 extra calories here, uh, you will lose one pound. Uh, per week. It is one pound gain, one pound loss. Uh, and also uh, here we are looking at uh, including exercises, uh, <coughs> including uh, exercises. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the basal metabolic rate and also we are looking at the resting uh, metabolic rate. And also, we are looking at the exercise metabolic rate. Okay, um, for the physical activity, we are looking at uh, uh, using larger muscles burns more uh, calories. Okay, the, um, the larger muscles of the body, uh, those you should be uh, able to know. Uh, things to do with the resting mes metabolic rate, are like I told you, this is what is expended by the body while the body is at rest or it is in its uh, non-active state under conditions uh, of uh, neutrality, okay, yes. And for the exercise metabolic rate, as we said, uh, that uh, this refers to that additional energy that is expelled uh, or incurred during uh, physical activity. All right, uh, for uh, calorie expenditures uh, increase with the weight and time spent uh, on activity, okay. Yeah. Uh, keeping weight uh, in perspective, ongoing uh, efforts required for weight loss maintenance. Yeah, uh, really, you're not going to do it for that. It's not only going to be you, the dietitian, or you, the physician, or the nutritionist. It's going to be a begging the individual to lose weight. The individual has to take that initiative coming from within the data. That's why you're seeing the next we're talking about lifestyle changes being necessary, like the healthy eating, the exercising, etc. Uh, very low calorie diets, uh, such as the severe restriction of 400 to 700 calories, still we reach that normal weight, and also medical supervision is required, risk of muscle loss, dehydration, ketosis, ketoacidosis. Ketosis is, uh, this happens when uh, uh, ketone bodies are developing in blood, okay, and when uh, this happens, in most cases, the ketosis will lead uh, to ketoacidosis, which will have uh, dire consequences 
really this comes uh, from when remember like i told you the two sources of calories really in the body the major ones are the carbohydrates and the fats so ketosis here this comes when the, 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 the energy source that is being used is no longer the carbohydrate but then the body is trying to use the fats uh, to produce energy or to produce uh, uh, an alternative form uh, where glucose is not and this happens when people are fasting when there is a restriction uh, of carbohydrates so uh, uh in most cases when uh, uh, the, the glycogen is restricted there will be a shift to fat metabolism okay uh, this happens like i told you if there is absence or insufficient glucose uh, so it will it will just switch itself automatically and here the fatty acids are broken down into uh, the, the process like i told you which was the policies uh, this will result at the production of these ketone bodies uh, there, there are a lot of what you will see there and so when these ketone bodies or the ketone levels in the blood rise this uh, beyond the threshold that is when we look at the ketosis happening and uh, which is always characterized by a shift in metabolism uh, where we are utilizing other fats uh, more than the carbohydrates that we are supposed to utilize uh, the drug treatment we are looking at uh, subtrauma in the hodiacodine, the herbal aid, the side effects will lead to the area part and soluble vitamin deficiencies. Remember that the, 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 fat, uh, uh, the absorption of these fat soluble uh, vitamins require fat to be around the oil. So if this is depleted, uh, in most cases, we will have these deficiencies happening. So you need to keep in mind all these once you're giving uh, this type of intervention uh, for weight loss. Stimulants such as caffeine and vitamin are like products under uh, risk of death. And we are also saying many of uh, the counter supplements have a bit of success. People are drinking everything they can uh, put their hands on. People are using aloe vera like nothing. They are using these uh, bitter lemons. Oh, a lot of people are trying as much as possible. Uh, I don't know where that uh, theory started, but the more bitter the food you're eating, it will help you burn down on the calories. But a lot, uh, very little success has been seen uh, on that. So really, we are going to look at uh, uh, the surgery. This would uh, come uh, in uh, other slides that you will see uh, uh, it uh, later on but really we are going to appreciate that when things have now gone wrong when people are omit, uh, omit what is it <coughs> when people are morbidly obese okay what happens what are you going to do should we just let these people die because even for a person to start exercising there is that weight that will help them uh, uh, where they can start uh, uh, exercising from but for people who can't even stand for people who can't even walk what should we do that is where these come in the gastric the surgery techniques the gastric bypass and its side effects and also we are going to be talking at the liposuction the procedures the risks and also the infections the scarring and the death so really uh, maybe uh, a brief about uh, the liposuction uh, we are looking at uh, excess removal of fat in all these uh, surgeries. But when we talk of uh, the Roxy and why uh, gastric bypass, we are looking at creating a small pouch and bypass the rest of the stomach, reducing absorption of food intake and food absorption, uh, like I will show you later on in the uh, slide. Hopefully it is there. Uh, with this, we are trying to reduce on the volume of the stomach or the size of the stomach. So uh, 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 it is uh, sold up, okay? Yeah, the, 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 remember the stomach pouch is like a small, uh, a small dish if you, you know your digestive system so well. It's like, it, it looks like a small dish. So it is sold up, a uh, part of it is sold up uh, and left out so that uh, you, whenever you eat, you can feel satisfied very early. So you won't have to put in more food into the stomach. So when this is done, yeah, individuals will be eating very low, and this is more on reducing intake. 
uh, so for the bilopancreatic diversion and duodenal switch, this is uh, also a, uh, really a little similar to this bypass. And for this, we are saying uh, uh, that uh, there is a portion of the small intestine that is bypassed, okay? So when uh, a portion of the small intestine, we know the small intestine is where most of the absorption of these nutrients passes or takes place. So part of it is taken off uh, through a surgical procedure. Part of the small intestine is taken off and it, uh, the remainder is reconnected. And once the remainder is reconnected, now the food is not uh, moving through the whole uh, uh, small intestine. It is having now a shorter part uh, in the small intestine and less will be absorbed. Little, little of the nutrients uh, will be absorbed at the end of the day. And if little are all absorbed, then what happens at the end of the day, we are reducing all the nutrients that are being taken in. Uh, this is what I was talking about uh, in this uh, gastric surgery. So uh, the rocks and, and why uh, surg surgery is this, okay? This is, uh, if you're seeing my cursor well, this is the part, uh, initially, the original stomach was extending up to this side, okay? But then it has been reduced to this and then the food uh, is allowed in very fast, okay? So that the food, uh, where once the food reaches here, initially, a person would still be eating if the stomach was distended up to this side uh, originally, how the individual was created. But since the stomach is now passing here, the porch of the stomach is uh, passing very close here, that means if a person even eats very little, they will feel satisfied. However, there are complications like we'll see later on. But for the duodeno switch, the, uh, that was the rocks and why. Uh, but for the duodeno switch, uh, part of the uh, alimentary canal, or we'll call it uh, 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 more of the uh, 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 <coughs> more of uh, what is required to be uh, put into the small intestine. Now it is uh, brought closer. Okay, yeah. So that the food is not uh, moving a lot uh, into uh, the, 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 the the normal way it was supposed to be moving. So a lot, a very little is being absorbed. Uh, at the end of the day, I hope we are clear with that. Okay, uh, sleep gastrostomy. We are looking at removing a porch of a portion of the stomach, reducing its size for food capacity. Uh, something a little bit similar to Roxanne and why. And also, we are saying uh, this gastric bypass is the most common type of gastric surgery due to its effectiveness and also the lower risk compared to the. BPDS, like I told you. Uh, the surgeon creates a small pouch at the top of the stomach. The remaining stomach is bypassed and uh, connected directly to the small intestine further down. And also the food enters the small pouch and bypasses most of the stomach, uh, leading to a reduced caloric intake and the feeling of satiety or fullness. And we are saying there is significant weight loss of 60 to 70%. Here we are looking at the morbidly obese individuals, those people whose BMI is above 45 or 40 and uh, above in most cases, but this is very relative because there are some morbidly obese people who can really lose weight where they do not need uh, surgery. Uh, uh, really, uh, I think uh, basically that is it uh, here with this. And we're saying it's a long-term improvement of uh, obesity-related conditions such as uh, diabetes and uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, I hope we all know what it means. When we talk of uh, sleep apnea, we're looking at uh, uh, the, 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 the condition that results from uh, an individual's uh, inability uh, to sleep. Or this is a sleep disorder whereby there is a... Uh, Actually, the other one is insomnia. Sorry, this one is called apnea. Uh, for apnea, this is characterized by those pauses in breathing, or that's shallow breathing during sleep, whereby you hear sometimes those noises and all those things that happen during the night. And this is uh, sometimes associated with uh, daytime fatigue, but mostly most people who you hear snoring at night. When people are obese, you will suspect them snoring and they will be hearing it uh, in the next room. Uh, so friends, let's uh, try as much as possible to wrap this up. We are looking at uh, this uh, gastric bypass uh, looks at the reduced risk 
of certain cancers that are associated with obesity. And uh, the side effects, uh, we have the damn thing syndrome. The rapid emptying of the stomach causes nausea and vomiting, sweating, then the nutrition deficiencies, the internal bleeding, leakage from these surgical sites, and uh, bowel obstruction. Uh, for the liposuction, we are looking at removal of fat deposits in specific areas of the body. In most cases, this is what actresses and actors do when they don't want to. Uh, they don't want. They want to appear in a movie, but they've gained weight because they were on holiday somewhere. So they will go for these uh, procedures, and we are saying here small incursions are made in the treatment area, and a cannula, a thin tube is inserted and connected to a sanction device, and. Uh, uh, the cannula moves back and forth, breaking up the sanction out of the fat cells, and these incisions are closed uh, with starches. Uh, risks of this, we are looking at infections, whereby it requires uh, antibiotic treatment and may lead to further complications. The scars that are always left, and this can be minimized by the proper technique, uh, but varies depending on the individual's healing. Some people heal uh, differently, and you will see this happening. Allergic reactions to anesthesia and medical uh, med um, the medications used during this procedure is also uh, always a concern. And also deep vein thrombosis where here the blood clots in the legs potentially leading to pulmonary embolism or the blood clots uh, that are really found in the blood moving and they reach uh, the lungs or uh, moving through the respiratory yes. system. Uh, in extreme cases, we are seeing death happening where extremely, which is sometimes rare, but can also occur due to these complications of anesthesia and uh, the reactions or, or the infections. Really, uh, this brings us to the end of today's engagement. Uh, it was quite a little bit uh, detailed, but you will find a way and go and read about most of these processes, the gastric bypass, read about the uh, obesity, the dieting, the basal metabolic rates, and the weight management. My friends, I think this is where we are, we are stopping for today, unless someone has a, a concern or something they want to ask. But I beg to end here. Do we have any concerns? Yes, Gabriel. Hey, Michael Dalang. Yes, you're, 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 yeah, you're but um, I'm using Gabriel's. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes Michael, Michael Dalang. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, the name I'm reading is Gala. <laughs> is Gabriel. Yeah, but it's yeah, fine. yeah, the name. The name is Gabriel because I'm using Gabriel phone. Yeah. Because he's having Wi Fi. Yes. yes. Yeah, Gabriel. thank you very much for the opportunity. So um so the issue is uh, for example like uh, we have discussed like uh, gastric uh, surgery. Yes. So you have talk of advantage of using gastric surgery or of benefits of uh, this kind of surgery. Yes. And also the impacts or the implications. So I also understand. But uh, what I need to you know is uh, the issue of uh, managing <clears throat> how can you manage uh, astro surgery nutritionally so managing what are the gastric surgery yes nutritionally so as a, as a nutritionist mm. how, how, how can i manage this condition how no, can this, i plan this, as a dietitian this, this so not a condition like i told you we are looking at management mm. All right. Yes. Yes. Obesity. Uh, in managing obesity, we were looking at uh, uh, how we manage the weight. And we first of all talked of the diet. We looked at the restrictions of intake and uh, things. But then, uh, if you are talking at uh, we are looking at uh, other ways, this is what we call a post-surgery nutrition. Okay. So there is a follow-up post-surgery or a dietary guideline that uh, your healthcare team will provide. Uh, you get me? Yes, I'm getting you, sir. But uh, there is another one. Another student is disturbing yes but i don't know please, maybe please he, he, he can close his background try to gabriel yeah so what i'm trying to say is a uh, uh, different different what we were talking about uh, weight management using that 
whereby we were uh, giving uh, the individual that foods that are really low in calorie and finding ways uh, uh, to limit the person's intake and also to limit the person's absorption uh, and utilization. However, when we are talking of the bypass, we are looking at where things have failed, okay? Where things have failed, now what do we do? Then this is where the plastic bypass comes in. This is where uh, the bypass which comes in. This is where all those things mm. come in, okay? But then, uh, all right. after, yeah. after, after a surgery, uh, this surgery is done, and still we have some nutrition uh, uh, guidelines we can use at the end of the day, mm. okay? Uh, if yes. you want, it may be for faster healing, uh, you could start to proposing these uh, post-surgery diets, starting with the mm. clear liquids and gradually ad advancing to those maybe the pureed foodstuffs and also focus on proteins remember the proteins are essential for healing and also other maintenance yes, yes. of the muscles okay yeah so yes, most sure. of these are the things you should do at the end of the day but really you're not managing this is not a condition that you're managing this is something that you do have yeah, uh, yeah. to to find a way of alleviating the metabolic suffering is it okay? metabolic issue mm. yeah that's yeah yeah it's okay thank you all right no problem yeah, is that all yeah, that is okay. Yeah, okay then. So, friends, I that think okay. let's meet tomorrow. Uh, you have a good night. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, no problem.